Good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Chandler, and thank you so much for being here. The time has all gone by so fast, and I can't wait to relive some of it here with you today. But before we really dive in, allow me to tell you a little bit about myself. So, I am the third of four siblings and the second of three girls. That makes me the younger middle child, which is an awkward fit, but it works out because I got to watch my two older siblings, Kevin and Kayla Kedney, struggle through Dojo Libby before I ever got here. I always, ha I always knew it was coming next at school, and I always had a tutor at home. Also, uh, I was in a choir called Music Masters at Antioch High School for about two years. You can see me there. Uh, in, that, in that choir, I won an Inspirational Soloist Award. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, I, was, I played softball for about 10 whole years, which is over half of my entire life. And um, in those years, I was a first and third baseman, as well as a pitcher and team leader on my team, Lady Buccaneers. My amazing teammate and catcher Kalani once said, Katie's heart is a softball, and truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> softball is where my passion became visible. It was where I went to escape any stress and sadness. It was my sanctuary, and my team was my family. I grew as a player, a leader, and a person through softball. As for where I'm going, I will be attending LMC starting this summer. Uh, I will be studying sociology, and after I do two years at LMC, I want to transfer to UC Santa Cruz. As for what I want to be after I graduate from college completely, I don't know exactly for sure, but I do know that I want to help people. Um, this has led me to believe that maybe I want to become an academic or emotional counselor on campus at a school, maybe. Um, I want to be this because I would love to help mentor people and then later on get to watch them succeed. That's what so many people here in this room have done for me, including Ms. Dorman, um, and I would love to do that for other people. Without further ado, it's on to my personal statement. Though my years at Dojo Libby were challenging, they shaped me into someone with an excellent work ethic and pulled me out of my shell. My time here is what made me realize I want to help people someday because this is what people here have done for me. I have grown so much, not only as a student, but as a person, and I can't wait for the world to see that. Every expert was once a beginner, Rutherford B. Hayes. I love this quote because it inspires me and it reminds me that no one was born a master of their craft. They had to work for it, which means that if I work just as hard or perhaps even harder, I can master anything I put my mind to. The picture you see is me at about nine or 10 years old. That is my beginning phase of commitment to softball. That is me as a beginner softball player and pitcher. And this is me as a beginner writer. So for the sophomore year first semester English final, we had to write an argumentative essay taking a stance on whether or not juveniles should be tried as adults for serious crimes. I argued that juveniles should not be tried as adults for serious crimes, but I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. This is a horrible essay. <laughs> uh, you can see that I did not follow a proper MLA format because my last name and the page number are not on the same line as each other, and both pages say that they're page number one. I, I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> uh, as for this tiny paragraph over here, uh, it's three sentences long, and it's a counterclaim paragraph. <laughs> Those paragraphs are supposed to be as long as, if not even longer than the rest of the paragraphs in the essay, because you have to acknowledge a, a, an opposing argument, state why you are so correct despite that argument, and then logically prove it with evidence. And there's just no way I could have done that effectively in three short sentences. As for this paragraph down here, I repeatedly state that a minor's brain can't allow them to control the decisions they make, which isn't entirely accurate, but more importantly, I provide no evidence that would support the fact that Minors' brains are less developed in that portion that controls rational decision making. Finally, for my conclusion, it's only two sentences long, and the first one is a run-on sentence with plenty of grammatical errors, but the second one just says, bottom line, kids are kids. And that is in no way an effective conclusion to any essay. Uh, an effective conclusion would be something that clearly restates your argument and then leaves the reader with something to think about. Now whenever I write essays, I always follow this advice, and I saw it on Tumblr somewhere. <laughs> if you can't picture yourself dropping the mic after your conclusion, it isn't strong enough. I cannot picture myself dropping the mic after this conclusion. But although that essay was a flop, improvement can be seen in my junior year statistical analysis for Algebra 2. Whew. This essay was the math portion of a larger project called Night at the Medical Museum, and in that project we were split into groups and then given a disease and a time period to research in depth and then do a large presentation on. I got rubella from the 1960s to the 1970s. So for this part of that larger project, we had to find a graph online, like the one over there, and we had to analyze it using mathematical terms and concepts that we were learning in Algebra 2 at the time. 
This essay was a bit harder for me to write because it was math-based and I do struggle quite a bit in that arena. However, I still did good and I definitely improved from the last essay. Uh, you can see that I follow proper APA format uh, consistently, aside from the fact that running head goes along all three pages when it's really only supposed to be on the title page. But other than that, um, Ms. Piper gave me full credit in that category. Uh, Mrs. Piper was also my only target audience for this essay, so it was okay that I used mathematical terms such as observational study without actually defining it in the essay. But if someone who wasn't an expert in math like she was had read it, they might not have understood what I was talking about. And by the way, an observational study is where the researcher attempts to understand the cause and effect relationship between two things that are going on, as like rubella and the time period of the outbreak. Um, but in this kind of study, they are not in control of their population or the kind of treatment that their population is receiving. So for the graph I chose, right over there, it is displaying the rate of infection for every 100,000 Americans in a given year. And to be successful in writing this essay, I had to analyze the type of study it was, hypothesize how they may have conducted the study, and then identify any potential bias the researcher could have had unintentionally. Uh, for example, if they went around to hospitals and they tallied up the number of patients who were in for rubella, they would miss anyone who could not afford to go to the hospital, and therefore an entire portion of the infected population would not be represented in the final results. Overall, in this essay, I knew my stuff and it showed. I had to pull from online sources to find this graph, and I had to pull from in-class lectures to ensure I was being accurate in my analysis. All my info information was clear enough for Mrs. Piper to understand, and I definitely improved on my voice and my grammar. However, I still can't picture myself dropping the mic. Senior year is when it really all came together for me. In AP literature, we wrote a lot of time rights to prepare us for the AP exam. These time, time rights truly sharpened my writing skills and my communication skills. Um, there were three different kinds of time rights. There's style analysis, open lit, and poetry, and you only have 40 minutes for each time right. In a style analysis time right, you are typically given a passage from a novel or other form of literature and prompted to analyze it, being sure to consider such literary devices as narrative perspective, which is the point of view from which the story is being told, or selection of detail. In the style analysis essay that I wrote, um, I had to analyze the complex relationship between two characters in George Eliot's Middlemarch. For every single time right that I do, I do the exact same process. And that is, I read the prompt and then I read it again, this time being sure to make any notes in the margins on anything I could use in my three body paragraphs. And then I also underline anything that seems significant for diction later on, perhaps. Um, after that, I identify two tones that describe the overall feel of the piece that I will later use in my thesis statement. And then I pick topics for my three body paragraphs and I write them in very short bullet points in a sort of mini outline. And then I write my thesis on the actual prompt paper so that I can always refer back to it to ensure that A, I never stray from the topic, and B, everything I'm writing ultimately supports that statement. So from the outline that I created for the style analysis essay, I scored myself a solid seven out of nine. Um, for all of the other essays, I do the exact same process. Um, in an open lit time write, you are given a prompt and you are prompted to give use a book of literary merit uh, to answer it with. Um, from, for this prompt up here, I, t I was told to pick a book, play, or epic poem in which someone is given a gift that is also a handicap, and so I chose The Large Sum of Money um, from A Raisin in the Sun, and then I did my process. Uh, lo and behold, I scored myself another seven. As for poetry time bites, uh, they're essentially the same as style analysis time bites, except for now, instead of a novel, it's a poem, or in this case, it was two poems to compare and contrast. But regardless of the prompt, I do the exact same process, and I scored myself another seven. Looking back to that terrible essay from my sophomore year, mm. no one would ever guess that these three essays were written by the same person who wrote that. Mm. Um, I have grown so much as, a, as an effective communicator, and I gradually got better at using my knowledge and researching to find knowledge to use effectively and form a cohesive argument. In the juvenile justice essay from sophomore year, I had little to no concrete details. In my statistical analysis, I had to find graphs online and then pull from in-class lectures. And for all of my senior year time rights, I had to use my previous knowledge of literary devices and novels that I have read to form cohesive arguments. The difference in skill level between then and now is shocking, and I am so proud of my growth as a writer. Uh, this will definitely help me in my future as a counselor and at LMC and UC Santa Cruz, because I know that I will always have to be communicating with patients, coworkers, professors, and more. Finally, I can picture myself dropping the mic. <laughs> 
No problem can withstand the assault of sustained thinking, Voltaire. This quote goes to show that any problem can be solved through intense critical thought, and that is a skill that Dozier Libby has well equipped me with through these projects. The Complementary and Alternative Medicine Project, otherwise known as the CAMP Project, uh, was intended to make us more culturally aware and sensitive people. For this project, we were split into groups and we were given a disease and location in order to do, uh, we had to research it in depth and then do a large skit presentation on it. Uh, within that skit, we all had roles, uh, such as an allopathic physician, a patient, traditional healer, and a cultural specialist, and that one was my role. Uh, all these different roles worked to show all of the different perspectives that were involved in the healing process, as well as to explain why a traditional healer might disagree with an allopathic physician about uh, the correct healing method for a patient. Uh, my group got Yaws in the Solomon Islands, and Yaws is a disease that is characterized by painful sores and lesions, as you can see on the child in the picture here, as well as joint and bone pain, and in severe cases, disability and disfigurement. Uh, the citizens of the Solomon Islands have very different beliefs than we do here in the U.S. Uh, for example, they believe that every disease has a spiritual cause to it and therefore has a spiritual solution. Oftentimes, they will use black magic to try and pull a bad spirit out of the infected person. This project forced us to use technology to research the rich history of the Solomon Islands and their way of life, which is very different from our own. And we had to really think about a solution to a problem that doesn't really have a clear solution and try to work effectively, but also respectively, with someone with a very different culture than our own to actually treat them in a way that doesn't disrespect them. This project set the stage for the much more in-depth and interactive International <coughs> Economic <coughs> Summit, otherwise known as IES. IES was essentially a series of projects that prepared us for one big day that is called Summit Day. Um, for this project, uh, we started by splitting into groups um, and picking a country along with a health equity issue that plagues that country. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that the overall goal of IES was to improve the standard of living for the people of our country. My group chose South Korea and our health equity issue with the alarmingly high suicide rates, especially among the elderly there. Uh, and the first portion of this big, great big project was the informative essay. Um, in this essay, we had to research the history, culture, music, arts, a health equity issue and more about this country and for this essay me and my group ended up with four whole pages of work cited which is more than I've ever had which just goes to show you how deeply we researched into this and all that research really paid off when we scored a 9.75 on this project. After that we had to focus on the picto charts and the motion graphic. The picto charts were to go onto our trifold display over there and um, they essentially said everything we put into the informative essay, but in much shorter and more concise bullet points, along with helpful images to ease understanding. Uh, then we had to do the motion graphic, which uh, essentially explained our health equity issue uh, and how truly terrible it was in our country and how we plan to solve that issue. And for these two portions of the project, the motion graphic and the picto charts, my group split it up so that it was me and my group made Aaliyah doing the motion graphic together and uh, Haley and Timmy, my other teammates, working on the <coughs> charts. So focusing on the motion graphic, me and Aaliyah had never ever made one before, and we had to truly adapt to this website called Powtoons, which is uh, just a website that helps beginner motion graphic makers uh, make something still engaging, despite being new to the art. Uh, we made a joint decision together to not include any sensitive or triggering imagery because um, our topic is so sensitive and we know some people might you know feel a way about it um, we plan to move the audience with our words and the truly alarming statistics that are taking place in South Korea and also include a narrative of a student in South Korea named Min Jun who is struggling with stress and depression which is a situation very common there um, Overall, we scored ourselves an 8.5 on this portion which is good considering the fact that we had never made a motion graphic before um, but after this, we had to focus on our alliance trading plan and our trifold. So for those who don't know, the alliance trading plan was a big part of our points on Summit Day. Um, essentially, for trading, we had to trade a specific amount of resources specific to our country. It was different for every country, D1, D2, T3. Um, but then we also had to receive that same amount of resources back. Uh, and we had to keep in mind that we had to try to get things that our country didn't have because the goal is to improve the standard of living. Um, to be totally honest, my teammate Aaliyah deserves all of the credit for this. Um, she made it work, she made a huge spreadsheet, she made it work so that nobody in our alliance had to trade outside of the alliance. And um, 
she made it work so that nobody had to trade outside of the alliance and nobody had to pay a tariff in order to trade outside of it. Um, then after this, she's the reason we got 100% on this, but after this we had to focus on our trifold display. Uh, this took many days and many nights to get right. Um, hmm. We were very inspired by South Korean architecture, which features um, raised corners, a lot of textured tiles, um, a large mural around the rim of the inside of it, um, and then also a large staircase that flows up into the entrance. And Aliyah made like a little, a little family. <laughs> um, so like I said, this took many days and many nights to get right and how we exactly envisioned it. Uh, but it really paid off when we were one of the teams awarded top table display. And then all of this work combined truly paid off when we were the team awarded overall summit champion. That, that you have no idea how good that felt after working <laughs> so hard. Um, so these projects required us to face a tough problem that does not have a clear solution and then use technology to find out more about the issue and ways that we could solve it. Because I now have these skills, I can use them in my career when I have to help patients identify the problems they're having and then use what I know to help them find a solution that works for them and also respects their cultures. The pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change. The leader adjusts the sails. This quote to me defines what a leader truly is. It's someone who identifies a problem and then actually works to solve it. In order to solve those problems, however, you have to have the ability to apply all of your knowledge to them. Um, through my years as team leader uh, in softball and as a student at Dozier Libby, I have become a person who can do both. The sci-fi essay was probably one of the hardest essays that I have ever had to write. Um, for this essay, we had to pick a superhero or sci-fi movie uh, and then pick three questions that pertain to physiology to research and then discuss in depth in a large essay. Uh, and I chose The Amazing Spider-Man and these three questions. Can a human break a sink with little to no effort? Can a human cling to and climb walls with adhesive hands and feet? And can a human actually regenerate their limbs, or specifically their hand? Um, I avoided asking the questions, could a human actually shoot webs out of their veins, or could a human actually become a giant lizard person? <laughs> because I felt like those were not grounded in actual science, but these questions potentially were. Um, so this essay was so hard because these questions, it was so hard because it required a lot of critical thinking. Um, because it was a superhero movie, you can't exactly Google, could Spider-Man actually do this? Because you would really just get fan theories. Uh, so I had to dig deep and I had to ask questions that like didn't pertain to the movie, but would help me find the information I was looking for so that I could learn from it and then take that information and apply it to a different situation in order to try and answer the questions I was asking. So for example, the first two questions, uh, could a human break a sink with little effort, or cling to and climb walls with adhesive hands and feet, um, I found some credible sources and learned a lot and I applied them to the questions. For instance, there are some humans who naturally produce a lot less of a substance called myostatin and they can be seen in the first two pictures of my title page. Uh, myostatin is a substance that decreases your body's ability to build muscle, so because they generate a lot less of it, they can generate a lot more muscle a lot more rapidly. Uh, and I took that information and I applied it to my question of could a human break a sink with little effort? And I figured maybe the radioactive spider bite did something to his body that made him decrease a lot less of, it, of that substance, myostatin. And therefore, without realizing he had all this new power, he broke the sink. Um, as for the um, climbing walls with adhesive hands and feet, I found a source that stated the larger the animal, the larger surface area of their body needs to be adhesive in order for them to be able to climb walls, which means that his hands and feet are not enough to account for his entire body. Uh, he would need something like a size 40 foot in order to be able to <laughs> climb the wall, and he clearly does not have that. Um, as for the question, could a human actually regrow their hand? Mr. Young gave me an article that studies the salamander and their ability for regeneration. Uh, and it was very fascinating because I found that limb regeneration in humans is actually hypothetically possible. Um, this is because limb regrowth is essentially the same process as initial limb growth, which means that we know our bodies have all of the tools that will help us to regenerate our limbs. And furthermore, we have fibroblasts with a common ability to the salamander, which is that they both have a memory of the spatial coordinates of our bodies, which means they know what they, need, they know what needs replaced and where. Um, and that was very fascinating to learn. Um, but this project got me started thinking critically and answering, 
questions, but the next one also got me to go out there and actually solve them. Um, well, so for this project, we were split into groups and we chose a health-related issue that we are passionate about. Uh, my, tr my group chose carbon emission because it is the number one greenhouse gas that is accelerating climate change. <laughs> and after we chose our groups in our issue, we had to research it in depth and then make a plan to be a part of the solution to that issue. Uh, my, me and my group took our knowledge that we had already learned that plants breathe in carbon dioxide and, and we applied it to our solution. And we planted succulents in our event in the student parking lot, as you can see in here. Uh, that used to be all weeds and we weeded them out and we invited people to come through our social media page where we advocated for our issue. And quite a few people from the senior family showed up. Not everyone in the picture is everyone who was there, but still. Um, aside from that, we created pins that I'm actually wearing right now. Um, and we've handed them out on campus. And additionally, we even sold succulents here on campus and all of the funds we raised went to the Carbon Neutral Charitable Fund which is a company that has planted millions of trees and even restored ecosystems through vegetation. Um, for the presentation portion of this project, we had to do what is called a Pecha Kucha, uh, which is where you have 15 seconds per slides and the slides advance automatically, which means that we really had to understand and know what we were talking about. Um, it took very deep research and understanding of our topic. Uh, and in order for this whole project to be successful, we had to be able to identify an issue, become a part of the solution to the issue, and then get involved in our community here at school through our event in the lot. Um, and then we had to advocate through social media and our buttons. These two projects together have made me a very critical thinker, and they have made me able to find reliable sources and conduct ethical research. Uh, the sci-fi essay was the stepping stone to taking actual action in the Be the Change project. Um, because I did these projects, I am now prepared to ask complex and hard questions and follow through and seek answers to them, but then even take it a step further and become a part of the solution to that question. Uh, this will definitely help me in my future career as a counselor because I will always be having to ask tough questions and working with people to help find solutions and be a part of them. <sighs> so, as my senior year comes to a close, I have so many people to thank for helping me through the past four years. Uh, first and foremost, I have to thank my softball team who have touched my heart and changed me for the better. I wouldn't be who I am if I had never met all of them. I also have to thank my friends, uh, both new and old. Sheena, Haley, Snowy, Timmy, Caitlin, and of course, Terry. Uh, you all have supported me academically and emotionally through so many obstacles, but also given me so many fond memories that I will cherish forever. And last but certainly not least, I have to thank my family. Um, <laughs> my big brother Kevin is the best tutor ever and he has spent many nights with me uh, working with physics and algebra 2 homework and he's the only reason I got a B in algebra last year. Uh, my big sister Kayla has been my only unwavering friend through everything. Uh, my little sister Kelsey has inspired me to set a good example of a strong woman and a hardworking student. And uh, my parents have loved me through every single dumb teenage mistake. And I couldn't be more thankful to have such patient, caring, loving, and accepting parents as you guys. Uh, I love you guys. And you and everybody else are truly cradle to grave. Uh, finally, thank you all for being here and listening to my journey and observing my growth. Um, I hope something I said was helpful to you and made you think and reflect. And it is now time for the next chapter. Are there any questions? <laughs>